This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Welcome to God's house. We continue our midweek Lenten series on God's amazing grace. And today we uh, see how God's amazing grace worked in the life of the woman at the well from John chapter 4 and how uh, God's uh, amazing grace is poured uh, abundantly uh, into our thirsting souls as well. So we'll follow the order of service as it's printed in your bulletin. As we come before the Lord to confess our sins, uh, let us stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. From Psalm 42. As a deer pants for flowing streams, so pants my soul for you, O God. When shall I come and appear before God? By day the Lord commands his steadfast love. I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? As with a deadly wound in my bones, my adversaries taunt me. Why are you cast down, O my soul, and why are you in turmoil within me? The Samaritan woman met Jesus as he rested beside the well. Jesus knew that this woman had not lived according to God's commandments, but he graciously invited her to drink of the water of eternal life. We do not live according to God's commands as we should, yet he looks on us in grace and love. Let us come before him confident in his steadfast love to confess our sins and ask his forgiveness. Almighty God, Daily we sin against your commandments. We turn away from your word and ways as we thirst after pleasures and temptations to satisfy our own desires. We are sorry for our sins and we thirst for your forgiveness. Have mercy on us and forgive our sins. God has had mercy on us. He sent his Son to be our Savior. Jesus took our sins onto himself, suffering the penalty of death that we deserve. I announce to you that your sins are forgiven in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The living water that Jesus gives becomes a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Please be seated. We continue by singing. Lord be with you. 
Let us pray. Almighty God, the woman of Samaria came to the well that day seeking only the refreshment of ordinary earthly water. Jesus offered to her what he offers to us, the life-giving water that wells up within us and overflows into eternal life. You refresh us with your spirit so that we will never thirst again. As the woman told others in her town that she had found the Messiah, lead us to be faithful witnesses for our Lord so that people will believe in Jesus as their Savior and receive through him the refreshment of forgiveness and eternal life. Hear our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. The Old Testament reading is from Isaiah chapter 55. Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And he who has no money, come, buy and eat. Come, 
buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which is, does not satisfy? Listen diligently to me, and eat what is good, and delight yourselves in rich food. Incline your ear, and come to me. Hear that your soul may live, and I will make with you an everlasting covenant my steadfast, sure love for David. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The epistle is from the Revelation to St. John, chapter 7. After this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. And they fell on their faces before the throne and worshipped God, saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders addressed me, saying, Who are these clothed in white robes, and from where have they come? I said to him, Sir, you know. And he said to me, these are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. The sun shall not strike them, nor any scorching heat. For the Lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd, and he will guide them to springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We sing. To honor our Lord Jesus, I invite you as you are able to stand for the reading of the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the fourth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. There came a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, how is it you, that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews have no dealing with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, 
you have nothing to draw water with, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty forever. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. Jesus said to her, Go, call your husband and come here. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You are right in saying, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one you now have is not your husband. What you have said is true. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. The hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. God has made us his people through our baptism into Christ, living together in trust and hope. We confess our faith. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. We continue with the next hymn.
When we live in denial, we live in isolation. We have something so difficult to bear that either we do not wish to burden others with it, or we are so ashamed of it that we keep it buried, perhaps also to ourselves. And so we live in fear, in doubt, and in anxiety. But then how do we become free? How do we become free to live beyond the doubt, the fear, and the anxiety of our shame? Well, we know that comes by the grace and the forgiveness that comes through us through the promise of Christ. And for which encounter with Christ we are all the better and all the more free. Consider one particular encounter of that grace for one who is living in fear, in doubt, and shame. A Samaritan woman who came to draw water from the well. Most other women would have already come to the well earlier in the day to draw water from it. But this woman came about 12 o'clock noon. She was not expecting to meet anyone. In fact, she was counting on not meeting anyone. But that's already one clue to her shame. Imagine her awkward surprise to find someone actually there by the side of the well. No one was there at that time. To make matters worse, the one sitting there was a man. And she did not realize who this man was, that it was actually Jesus. Nor did she know that he was tired from a long journey while his disciples were off somewhere getting food. She just wasn't expecting this encounter or any kind of encounter. Complicating this rather awkward situation, the woman recognizes that Jesus is not just any man, but that he is a Jewish man. She is a Samaritan. And Jews and Samaritans did not exactly get along. It would be like in the upper Midwest, Bears fans and Packers fans, if you know anything about football. They don't get along. There were many prejudices, divisions, even hostilities between them. Of course, we know something about that, about prejudices, divisions, hostilities in our time and in our own lives. In fact, we often avoid those situations. Perhaps we even avoid those encounters as well. But as we will see, grace makes unexpected encounters. As if it is not bad enough for this poor woman in this particular setting to be caught at noon looking for water and then encountering this male Jewish stranger, that this man whom we know as Jesus now has the audacity Speak directly to her. Give me a drink. What Jesus did would already be considered a breach of social customs. He should not be seen with this Samaritan woman, let alone speaking to her. Though awkward silence is now broken by an even more awkward command from an unknown man to a woman who wanted to be alone. Might his talking to her in this very unexpected and awkward moment also be a moment in which grace is coming to this woman? Maybe, but she doesn't see it that way, at least not right away. In fact, she makes a point of it, putting up the barriers that have divided not only the genders, but also the peoples, but also hiding her deeper frustration and concerns. How is it that you, a Jew, ask of me, a woman of Samaria? Most of us would be silenced by such a quick comeback, maybe even apologetic. But Jesus is not put off to the point of leaving the woman alone. He knows that she already has 
so much of that being alone, that loneliness going on in her life. And it's not exactly that she is alone in that either. Loneliness today also consumes us. Instead, he dares to speak to her yet again to make this a moment of grace, a grace moment. And so he explains his attentions of grace to her. He says, if you knew, if you really knew the grace of God and who it is that he is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have spoken to him and asked him, and he would have given you living water. Sir, you have no bucket, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our ancestor Jacob, who gave us this well, and with his sons and his flocks drank from it? The word sir is something we might say perhaps to uh, someone who is our elder or, or, or a person whom we only have a business dealings with. We need to be polite to. And perhaps this first use of the word sir by this woman has some of that connotation. It is respectful, but really only so far. For now the woman is only intrigued at best. Jesus mentioned living water. Where is it, she wonders. Where are these flowing streams of living water so that she can go find it for herself whenever she wants it? She would like to know so that she would not feel so constrained to keep coming to this well day after day, always in hiding, and instead find flowing streams for her life. But Jesus graces her life even further, saying, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but those who drink of the water that I will give them will never be thirsty. The water that I will give will become in them a spring of water gushing up to eternal life. Sir, give me this water so that I may never be thirsty or have to keep coming here to draw water. Here is the second time she calls him sir, and this time with a, maybe a little bit more respectful tone. Perhaps she's getting somewhere now. Maybe this stranger Jesus is on to something of interest. So she dares to trust that he may not, not, may not only know where such living water is, but that he could actually provide it. After all, might such living water be better than the still waters of this well? But she is also letting down her guard of the secret she is hiding. What she betrays in this moment is that she is tired of her daily, mundane, routine attempt to keep coming over and over to this well of Jacob. And also why it is she keeps coming at this time of the day. Jesus will indeed call her out from that, call that out from her, not to embarrass her, not to feel make her feel any more awkward than she already does, but she will call that out from her to free her, to give her the courage to stand in truth. So he says back to her. Go call your husband and come back. I have no husband. Now keep in mind that Jesus only pursues this conversation at this point with such gentleness in order to free her from the darker truth she does not wish to have exposed. And he makes his next statement to her with that spirit of affirming gentleness. You are right in saying, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands. And the one you now have is not your husband. What you have said is true. It may sound like Jesus is putting this woman on the spot, but really this is a moment of her freedom. Her freedom from shame. Her freedom from fear and doubt hostility, and division. She does not need to fear in Jesus' presence. 
He knows all about her secret, but he still sees her with grace and wishes her to be free in that grace. Regardless of her status, he does not look upon her with shame, but he looks upon her with grace. Let's be honest, my friends, we also have deep, buried, dark secrets and skeletons in our closets as well. We're afraid of the truth being disclosed, afraid of the criticism, the judgment, afraid of being mocked, scorned by others. That's why we keep these things hidden, away from others. We don't want them discovered. But even for us, Jesus does not look upon us with shame. He looks upon us with grace. And his grace is far superior to all judgments, real or imagined. In Christ, we do not need to be afraid or ashamed. And so now the woman is free to call him sir once more, but this time more, with much more a robust sense of Jesus as Lord. Sir, I see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you say the place where people must worship is in Jerusalem. Here the challenge is put before Jesus. How will you, Lord Jesus, overcame, overcome the great barriers of hostility and prejudice that have been in place for so long? How will you, Lord Jesus, overcome the great divides that keep us apart from so many others? in gender, in race, in orientation, in values, in politics, and being shunned and isolated. The list goes on, but all of them are things which we just don't even discuss openly or candidly, without fear, without shame. For this, Jesus will point to where his journey is leading. His will be the hour that will bring reconciliation between us. And his hour is his own cross where all prejudices, hostilities between peoples are put at rest in his body and his blood shed for us, where the path of violence and hostility gives way to the path of peace, and where the shame of our sin is overcome by healing and wholeness. His hour, his cross, brings this grace to us all. So Jesus says to the woman, the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father seeks such as these to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. Grace makes unexpected encounters, and we will continue to make unexpected encounters. It encounters all of us in our darkness and frees us to the truth that real, we really do not need to be living in fear and alienation from others, that we do not need to be afraid of our own past and the truth of our sins. Instead, we are spirited to a new truth, the truth of Jesus himself. For the woman at the well, this truth now stands before her and now she is already a heartbeat away from her own bold confession of faith. I know that Messiah, the one who is called Christ, is coming. When he comes, he will proclaim all things to us. Jesus says to her, I am he, the one who is speaking to you. At that moment, the disciples return. They see Jesus speaking to her. Perhaps they, like us, are a bit embarrassed. Still caught up in all the old ways of keeping up our walls and our barriers and good appearances. Perhaps it may have already seemed to them an awkward moment. Why is Jesus engaging in conversation with one who is so distant, so foreign, so shameful? For this woman, that distance, that foreignness, that shame, now gives way to the grace of Christ. The grace that overcomes all sin and division, that leaves no one ashamed or afraid, or even afraid of encounter. 
we become a people with the fullness of living water, his spirit and truth. But Jesus' own disciples have some growing to do in that grace. This was not the last time that Jesus would have been left alone by his disciples. We know that he was also left alone at the hour of the cross, which also came right about noontime. At that hour, Jesus was tired and thirsty. But his disciples, nowhere to be found. Even on that occasion, and despite his thirst, he would offer the living water of his own life, his own being, for us all. But his disciples were living in the locked room, perhaps ashamed of themselves, afraid of any encounters with the outside world, alone in their shame. Yet for them and for us all, Jesus would then come later, after his resurrection, and say, Peace be with you. Grace makes unexpected encounters, as it did for his disciples. The woman of this story, however, has fled this scene, but not in fear and shame. She leaves behind her water jar, the symbol of all the old water of the well of life. Now she flees with a newness of living, of the living water she has running through her veins, Grace, the gift of grace that she has received from Jesus. For her, it was like Easter morning. She will run to the others with all the boldness of a new woman, with truth and a spirit that, sti that she still shakes from the sheer joy, all for which she was once afraid and ashamed. But now all of that is over and forgiven. What lies ahead now is a life of living in that newfound grace and freedom. Come and see a man who told me everything I have ever done. He cannot be the Messiah, can he? The woman witnesses now to others. These are first of many such grace encounters. Others will now come to Jesus and will not miss their own chance to make encounters with him and with his grace. And like the woman, they too will let go of all the truth of their old lives of sin and fear and shame and instead embrace the boldness of Jesus' living water running through their veins. There are no more barriers to grace. Jesus the Christ has indeed come. He told me everything I have ever done. So others from Samaria came to be with Jesus, and there would be celebrations of grace that would last for days more in his presence. And in the sharing and the gatherings of his grace, they would also come to make their own bold testimonies, saying to the woman with gratitude, but also with personal joy in the presence of Jesus. It is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have now heard for ourselves, and we know that this truly is, the Savior of the world. And when Jesus would rise from the dead, he would instruct his disciples to take his a message of amazing grace, not to just Jerusalem, not to just the uh, comfortable near surroundings, but to all of Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So that joy and freedom may abound for all. For grace makes un unexpected encounters, breaks down the walls of anger and hostility, sin and death, and fear and shame. My friends, we are graced with the living waters of Jesus, the Christ, who has overcome our fear and our shame. And now with the living waters of Christ in our own veins, we are free to go make some unexpected encounters of our own so that through our own witness we may testify to the Savior of the world, where no one needs to live any longer in fear or shame, but may instead be truly free. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us now join in singing of God's amazing grace in the hymn on the bottom of page 9 in your bulletin.
Many thanks to Bobby for uh, helping with the uh, uh, dialogue uh, this day and of the woman and of the we- at the well. Uh, in response to God's word, we are now bold to come before our Heavenly Father in prayer as he has invited us to do. As we come before the throne of God, as you are able, let us stand. Lord Jesus, you graciously invited the Samaritan woman to believe in you as the Messiah and Savior, to drink of living water of the Spirit. We too trust in you as our Lord and Savior. You have given to us the gift of the precious living water that is the Spirit of God welling up to eternal life. Gracious Lord, Lord Jesus, we pray that you would continue to sustain us with your spirit during this earthly life. Fill us with the peace and hope that are found only through repentance and forgiveness in your name. Help us to grow in grace and strength of faith through the study of your holy word so that we might serve others in your name. Gracious Lord, Lord Jesus, we pray for those who thirst for help and hope in their suffering. Comfort those who face illness, grief, and loss in their own lives and in the lives of loved ones. Empower us by your Spirit to comfort them with the promises of your word. Gracious Lord, Lord Jesus, we look forward to the day when we will live forever in your presence and drink from the water of the river of life in paradise. Until that great day, lead us to show mercy to others and to share our blessings to satisfy their earthly needs, their hunger and thirst. Gracious Lord, Lord Jesus, you asked the Samaritan woman for a drink of water, beginning the conversation that led her to trust in you as her Savior. She then told the people of her town about you, and they too believed. Help us by your Spirit to begin such conversations with our friends and neighbors, so that they will believe and worship you as their King and Savior. Gracious Lord, In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. After this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Guide will wipe away every tear from their eyes. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. We sing.
Go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you.